Hi, everybody. My name is Natalie Yeadon, and I'm one of the co-owners and managing directors with Impetus Digital. Impetus Digital has built some of the best-in-class asynchronous and synchronous virtual collaboration tools for life science companies to do things like virtual advisory boards, virtual steering committees, virtual medical education. And since COVID-19, we've also been virtualizing people's POA brand rollouts, sales and MSL training and all kinds of things in between. But more importantly, at Impetus, we really believe that everything starts with a conversation. It starts with a big, hairy, audacious goal, idea, thought, which then leads into a conversation, which is the kinds of things that we are doing on this YouTube and this podcast channel. When we speak with provocateurs like the Philip Alvarez of the world and others who are doing some really leading and bleeding edge things so that we can all collectively work together to positively disrupt healthcare. So we're really excited to have Philip Elvelda here with us today. He's got a very impressive background and I certainly am not gonna give justice to all of the things that he has done. He is a technology and industry innovator as well as a very well-renowned educator. Um, he holds a bachelor's degree in physics, so all of our favorite, uh, our favorite subject, uh, from Cornell University. He also has a master's and a PhD degree in computer science and electrical engineering from MIT. So he's definitely a smart guy. So he's currently the CEO and co-founder of BrainWorks. And in the past, uh, Dr. Alvelda was the founding CEO of Moby TV. Uh, he launched this to be the world's first live television experience over mobile networks. And it's now the third largest television distributor in the US. Pretty impressive statistics there. He holds over 30 patents and patents that are pending on a wide range of technologies. He's been awarded a technical Emmy Award and he's a regular invited speaker at media, telecom, and education industry events, including the World Economic Forum. So welcome, Philip. So happy to have you here. Yeah, real pleasure, Natalie. Thanks so much. So I, like I was just saying, I was so impressed when we were taking a look at your background. I, I guess really the question is, what have you not done? Um, I, <laughs> you know, I kind of... <laughs> <laughs> you know, we obviously want to get into the work that you're doing at BrainWorks because there's some super cool stuff there, but we'd be remiss not going over some of the really interesting career trajectory that you've had, starting off with working with NASA's Jet Propulsion, Propulsion Lab, then you actually went over to found the Micro Display Corporation. Uh, we already talked about you became the CEO of Moby TV, uh, Tada in Innovations, and then what I love most of all is that you were a program manager for the Biological Technologies Office at DARPA, um, and have done all kinds of things around things like education superhighway. Tell us a little bit about this, you know, the ins and the outs of this, this crazy road that you've been on. Well, I, I think uh, the key for me was that from, from an early age, I bored easily. So um, <laughs> you know, I would always, you know, look for something new and interesting to learn and discover and um, you know, I was I was really fortunate in that my parents, you know, one was a lifetime educator. Uh, my mom, you know, was one of the first people to earn a PhD degree as a woman here in the United States, uh, right right here near here nearby uh, at at Berkeley. Um, and dad was an engineer for the Coca Cola Corporation, and he joined that company because they were the first company that ever purchased an IBM computer. Uh, and so, you know, he he went there to work on the first commercial computer. Uh, so, you know. My, my youth was, uh, you know, I ended up in science and technology, not because of my schooling, really, but, but more the, the environment that my parents created at home, where there was always something interesting lying around. There was either a microscope over here or a model of a physical, you know, a mechanical computing device called a, a, a Digicomp, a tiny little toy that you could buy in the, in the 70s. Um, and, uh, and, and so I, I think that I, I was always just, you know, encouraged to be curious. And the other thing that I think I, I took for granted at the time, but now kind of looking back, I think, um, was that I, they, they both taught me kind of, I think by example, to be impatient with problems. Uh, so kind of the curiosity plus the impatience, you know, had me really going. And I think the other teaser, of course, is what my dad, uh, uh, you know, had, had been a science fiction writer since, uh, you know, reader since, since he was very young. 
Uh, and there was a moment, you know, a very formative moment for me when I was eight years old and I discovered the box of, of uh, you know, the giant box of, of science fiction novels. Uh, and then I more or less disappeared for, uh, for a month and a half, you know, reading everything that was in the box and, and, and beginning to imagine how the future could be different and better. Uh, and that, that bug never went away. Um, and that's really what I've, I've made a career of is, um, I think, you know, learning the things that I needed to create you know, the tools and the, and the capabilities of the future. And how do you turn what you can imagine today into, you know, real operating technologies that, that make everyone's lives better. So what were some of these nuggets? I mean, starting off with the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, and you were playing around with sensors, that sensors that are got sent up to space and some of the space shuttles and Galileo and the Magellan. So can you imagine a better job? Can you imagine a better job, you know, as a first job out of college? <laughs> you know, fiddling with stuff. How did you land there? Who did you, who did you know and how did you land there? And like, what were yeah. those key nuggets that you got from that experience? You know, I, I think, you know, I, I, I was completely lucky at Cornell where uh, I was interested in astrophysics. Carl Sagan had been an inspiration for me with the Cosmos series, you know, in the 70s. Um, and when I showed up at Cornell, you know, I just completely coincidentally, I walked into the lobby of the space sciences department there just when he was pinning up like a, a summer internship job post offering. And I said, is that still open? <laughs> and he's like, well, who are you? <laughs> wow. And I, and I right got place the job. Right time. Uh, yeah. And it was a totally, totally random, you know, right, right place, right time kind of thing. It was just miraculous. Um, but, but that got me into the space bug. And, and I think that, um, uh, you know, when, when the job interviews started rolling around, there were all sorts of companies interviewing for physics majors at Cornell. And, but I, I had my eye on the NASA uh, position and I interviewed with a bunch of the different NASA centers. And the most interesting one was the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. And I, and I got to join uh, the Celestial Sensors Group there that was building instruments to fly on the space shuttle and uh, you know Galileo and Magellan satellites that went to Jupiter and, and Venus respectively. So you know, as a relatively junior person, it was super cool. They, I showed up and they said, here's a sensor that we made that doesn't quite work, fix it. <laughs> and, and if you fix it, it'll go up on space. You know? and, 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 so, and so that was really, really quite amazing. Um, and so I did that for a little while. And then, and then there was a moment where uh, a bunch of admirals and generals walked into the lab where, where we were working and showing these sensors. And, and you have to remember, this is the era where digital cameras didn't exist. And, and we were building these sensors with the first charge coupled device sensor cameras, which were the, you know, the, these little parts that were coming out of Sony and RCA in the very early days, very low resolution, literally like 200 pixels by 200 pixels. Um, but they were digital for the first time. And so we, we built what were effectively the first digital cameras and put them in the spacecraft so that we could, you know, focus on, on, you know, galaxies uh, and nebulae and, and so on that, uh, that you couldn't see from the ground. And so we, uh, that was a really cool project. And when, when the military walked in, they said, so you can track stars and planets. Can you track other things? <laughs> and of course, you know, they wanted us to track uh, ballistic missiles. You could tell by the patches on the side of their shoulders. They wouldn't really tell us what the problem was. They just said, we need advanced sensors to track stuff in space. And we're the military, so figure it out. Um, and, and so we, we began working on the problems to, to track ballistic missiles. And the, the answer of the day was, you know, sorry, you know, these machines can't do it. We just don't have the computing power. Uh, the sensors aren't capable enough. They said, well, okay, um, work on it. See what you can do. And, and that was, you know, in the era of uh, Ronald Reagan's strategic defense initiative, what everyone called the Star Wars uh, missile defense program. And, uh, and so as a result, I began to think about, well, you know, how could you make a computer that would do more of what a human could do in, you know, looking at an image or a video and saying, well, I can obviously see the, the track of the missile in this, in this video, but my computer can't identify it with all the noise and the, and the distractions and the, the chaff and other things that, that people do to try to hide missiles. And so, um, and it came down to this idea that we were building computers that really weren't quite capable enough, but they were so different from the human brain that they operated in, in just a completely different way. And so that was, you know, kind of in the mid 80s. Uh, where I became interested in making computers that worked more like human brains. And, and ultimately, I ended up uh, uh, doing some work there at JPL that, that built some new technology for that, uh, but determined that I didn't really know enough. I knew the theory, but I didn't know how to make the things. 
And I was determined not just to think about it, but I wanted to make a physical thing and, 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 and make it real. And so I went back to school at MIT and, uh, and joined the artificial intelligence lab there and began to work on you know, what, it, what could a next generation of computing be that would, that would do more human-like things. Uh, and then after that, I began starting companies and, um, and each company that I started had some aspect of artificial intelligence in it as an enabler. Uh, but, but, you know, the, the journey through DARPA uh, to create the brain machine interface industry was really, you know, about having impact, but also kind of getting instrumentation that would let us figure out what's really happening in here. What's really happening inside the brain uh, that, make, that makes our mental computer so capable uh, relative to, you know, our hardware ones. And, uh, yeah, so, Phil, and so Phil, this is a really interesting topic because I mean, you know, so just sort of lingering a little bit on on all of these things that have evolved for you that have just fallen into your lap in some ways through a place of allowing and, you know, one thing led to the next, which was just this natural progression. But when you said that you enrolled in the artificial intelligence uh, group at the time, and, you know, and then we, we, we fast forward into today's version of this. When we think about the word artificial intelligence, there's, there's a lot of, it feels very nebulous to a lot of sort of the, the general public is they think it might be just this robot walking around that can, you know, read your, read your mind. And, and in fact, there's, there's a lot more components to this. And there's, there's also a ton of things that have been embedded into this, you know, these multi uh, algorithmic concepts and neural networks and all sorts of complexities. And then a lot of science built around uh, cognition and neuroscience and, you know, in that whole dynamic. So I was wondering if you can kind of excavate for us is the evolution of this nebulous concept of artificial intelligence then and what it looks like today. Well, you know, the, the interesting thing is the dream has never really changed. You know, the dream has always been, you know, can we make an, uh, an artificial system that can think and do things that a human can do? And, you know, whether it's reason or infer or predict, um, uh, really it's about navigating the world that we live in and solving the problems that, you know, we currently need people to solve. Um, whether it's, you know, picking fruit in the field or, uh, you know, treating disease in the hospital or, you know, managing a car as it's driving down the road. Uh, these are all things that today, you know, we have to do work to do. And, and really kind of the, the story of um, technological advancement has always been, how do we get machines to do more and humans to do less? Uh, or you can phrase it as how can a, a human use a machine to do more than they could without the machine? Um, so so that, that has been a constant throughout. And, and I think what's changed is, um, you know, our, our growing understanding of how complex the brain really is, which, you know, in the 60s, you know, we, we had people like Turing and others, uh, Licklider at DARPA and a few other places, really setting out, you know, what the goals were. And those are dead on still the goals today, is to create those systems that capably solve these problems. Um, but, but I think at the time, there was a lot of hubris that says, okay, we understand some bit of circuitry, if we model the human brain like this circuit, you know, then we'll have AI. And AI that they were thinking about in that sense was general intelligence. How can I have something that's indistinguishable from a human? So, you know, you may have heard of the Turing test where, you know, you have a conversation with a system, you know, how long would it take you to figure out, you know, whether the system is, a, is an artificial computer or whether it's a human. Um, and then, of course, you know, you had great fictional retellings like in Blade Runner where, you know, you had Decker trying to figure out, you know, is it a replicant or not? Am I a replicant or not? You know, so all of that is, is really quite, quite cool. But, um, but I think the, the, the real uh, puzzle, of course, was that the, the complexities of the brain uh, were beyond our capability to understand back then. We just didn't have the instruments that could look at the brain in meaningful ways uh, and, and figure out what was really going on. Um, so I, I think, you know, fast forward to today's day and age, you know, our compute power has grown tremendously. Our ability to simulate things has grown tremendously. And, and what you're seeing is that every year, you know, we're taking some aspect of the brain where we understand a little bit more, we're advancing, you know, how do we build a computer simulation of that? Um, and we're starting to capture the power of more and more of the brain. So, you know, if you were to ask me, well, how much have we captured so far? You know, how, how close are we? Is there a, 
is there really a, a, a threat of exponential growth in technology today where, you know, the Terminators are going to take over and, and, you know, we're at risk in some near term? No, I don't think so. Uh, and, and, you know, I, the way I would phrase it is, you know, the people that do more work, you know, the, the closer you are to working in machine intelligence and AI, the less you're worried because you know how shitty the systems really are today. Uh, they're not capable of plugging themselves in and, you know, turning a wheel <laughs> on their own. You know, there's, there's no connection between what the computers are doing and solving general complex problems. So let me give you an example. So the, the type of, you know, system that we've captured in the brain is equivalent to like a cubic centimeter of our visual cortex that, that is dedicated to identifying faces and pictures. So that nailed it. You know, we now understand that piece of the brain so well, we've got artificial systems that outperform now how humans do that. Um, so great, we can identify faces in, in, in pictures. Um, you know, we're, we're not quite at steering a car yet. Um, we're at, you know, extracting sentences from text and speech, but we're not very good at extracting what they mean. Sarcasm, beyond us. <laughs> so we, we, we're not quite there in replicating little bits, but, you know, imagine, what, what have we solved? Like a cubic centimeter in the back of the head for the visual cortex for face identification, maybe a cubic centimeter, uh, you know, over the auditory cortex to, to simulate um, you know, what we do when we, when we hear a noise and we can parse a, a word out of the, of the stream of speech. Um, but if I were to say, you know, suppose a doctor tells you what your diagnosis is and asks you whether you'd like to be treated. Economic considerations, ethical considerations, um, complexities of family management, contagion, and all of these things that are implicit in that discussion that are in the framework of what any human knows when they're 18 or older, we've not built any of that. And, and when you think of executive function, you know, my, I've just, uh, I've got a 15 year old daughter who, you know, is kind of in the throes of, uh, I would just say the tail end of the rewiring of her brain so that she has executive function where she can actually, you know, predict the consequences of her, of her actions. Um, and, you know, this is what every parent manages where, where the child goes through puberty, where they start with great recall and no executive function. And then they go through this messed up period in puberty where everything is kind of not functioning exactly right while it's rewiring. And then they emerge, hopefully, <laughs> got my fingers crossed, uh, you know, in a, in a couple of years with, with executive function where they've got a system to say, if I do this, good things will happen. If I do this other thing, bad things will happen. I better do the good thing direction. So, so I think, um, you know, we, none of that machinery has been built in most artificial systems. So when you ask, you know, how can we build the next generation of AI tools, um, you know, our approach at BrainWorks is that we're, we're trying to build more of the pieces that have been missing so far so that we can handle more complicated things. So, for example, in healthcare, um, you know, we're, we're looking at what are the pieces of the brain that you need to wire together to be able to have a conversation about treatment, to be able to handle things like ethics of treatment and not just, you know, what is the diagnosis. So, and I, and I think our goal, you know, I want to be really clear, our goal is to not need human beings to do rote work. You know, it's like, it's the equivalent of, uh, you know, instead of, you know, going to the stream and fetching the water with a pail, you know, we want to build the aqueduct to bring the water and, and, and without us having to do anything, it just happens. And so our first target, you know, at, at BrainWorks, when we built the Medio Smart Health System was, was to automate the process of taking vital signs. And, you know, you think, okay, well, what's the big deal? Well, you know, vital signs are something that you need to do before any medical procedure or diagnostic. The FDA requires, you know, know how your patient is before you decide what to do with them. But today to have your vital signs, you know, evaluated at a, by a doctor at a kind of a clinical grade of accuracy, you've got to go to a hospital and not everyone can do that. Maybe they're not close enough. Maybe they can't afford it. Um, maybe they don't feel like it. Maybe they're incapable or too infirm to, to make it. Or maybe they're not even aware of something being wrong. And so they see no reason to go to a hospital. And then they're surprised by some medical catastrophe. And this is, this is actually what brought us to this problem. Because, you know, when we were thinking of, of all these, you know, different worlds of opportunity, you know, we, we've got these new, more advanced AI systems that work more like a human brain. We've kind of built more of the pieces to handle more complex problems. What do we do with it? Every time we looked at something like education or transportation or energy, certainly applications across the board, every time we'd come back to medicine as 
the biggest need, the most pent demand, uh, the largest opportunity, the largest. Okay, so I'm just going to stop you there for a second. So, so I, th I think just for the people listening here is that you have created a company called BrainWorks. And the premise behind BrainWorks is that you have the intention of, uh, you know, building smart technology that kind of mimics the human brain to help solve big, hairy, audacious problems in the healthcare system. That's right. And one of the first things that you're trying to do is you've created this new tool called Medio Smart Health that's really focused on what you're calling um, ambient biometrics and capturing information sort of seamlessly, invisibly, without anybody kind of knowing that they're doing this, using a variety of different, like you call sensors, so all the smart stuff that you've developed years and years ago, or the concepts, so people can, so the, this information can be seamlessly absorbed by a person without them even knowing or trying, um, so that they don't even, you know, potentially even manipulate it because they, they're not, you know, knowingly or consciously entering the information, it's just seamlessly being inputted, and that that information gets, you know, packaged and, and processed. So tell us a little bit about that specifically, why you were targeting, and I know you've mentioned this in videos as well, that you're targeting sort of like the cardiometabolic issue as a, as a main issue. So walk us through what would happen to a typical person you know, from, from, you know, the time of, you know, inception of the sensors to what kind of gets spit out at the end in terms of data and, and evaluation. Yeah, that's a, that's a great framing. Thank you, Natalie, as I was on my long rant. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the original goal for us was to figure out how to benefit, you know, cardiac and, and pulmonary care. And when we began working on it, we, we asked the, the hospitals for data to help us figure out, you know, how could we surface insights and, and, and guide what should happen to the patients. But, but when that happened, you know, we would get a huge chunk of data after someone had had a heart attack or after they had had a stroke, but nothing before. And, and that was a, um, a really kind of illuminating moment for us because we realized that the fundamental reason we have a reactive healthcare system, so you have a crisis and then you're treated, is because we don't see the crisis coming. And we don't see the crisis coming because no one's being evaluated before they think they have a problem. And so the key for us was to realize to, to move medicine towards preventive care, we needed to change how we're evaluating people. And, and we realized that was really the golden opportunity to, to solve what has been the holy grail of medicine for, for 20 or 30 years that, that's a, really eluded us. And so we realized if we can make the diagnostic process so inexpensive and so automated that it can happen all the time at zero cost, and with, with zero effort from, from people, that's when we can be looking out for your health all the time and notify you of worrying trends long before you have a crisis. And so that, that we realized was a, was a worthy, you know, big, hairy, audacious goal, you know, in the parlance. Uh, and it was hard, right? You know, how, how is it that you can do that with no friction, with, with, you know, with, without people having to worry about it or do anything or go anywhere? or even pay attention to having it happen. And so that's how we came up with the idea of ambient biometrics. We wanted it to be ambient in the sense that it was just in the, in the environment around you, just like you know, the oxygen that you breathe, you don't really notice it, but if you don't have it, that's bad. <laughs> so you know, we're, we're trying to make the same thing in terms of a sensor system that could be you know, on the laptop as we're in the Zoom call. Uh, you know, can we use the, the camera sensor in particular just by being in the feed of a camera could we you know, read your vital signs and, and perform clinical grade assessments? And with these new technologies, we just, you know, after a good bit of work, we convinced ourselves it was possible and then we went and built it and now we've got it operating. So, so that's the Medio Smart Health System. And it's not meant to deceive anyone or hide the fact that we're you know, looking after you <coughs> or you know, record things and, and use them against you in any way. Um, and you know, we, we should have a, a talk about ethics and how can the technology be misused and, and so on. Uh, but but the goal is to make something that is always looking after for your health and, and recording the data and giving you insights into how are you doing? Are you doing well? Are you doing poorly? Are you getting better? Are you getting worse? Are you headed for a crisis? Do you need to change what you're doing somehow? Or should you seek medical care now so that you don't you know, end up in the emergency room in a few weeks? Uh, so that was the idea. And so that's what we built. So that's what Medio Smart Health is. It's, it's a system that you know, any camera... Uh, that you turn on and sit in front of 
uh, can look just by, you know, you know, really analyzing the wash of the blood across your face, how often this happens, what's the speed, uh, and so on, uh, we can actually determine quite a lot about your health. We can, you know, figure out your pulse rate, your pulse rate variability, your blood oxygenation, your blood pressure, um, a whole series of things, of course, that you can use to do diagnostics. And so, how, so how does this work, Philip? So I know that you have a downloadable app. So the question comes down to is, things get built into physician habits if it is well integrated in the workflow, right? Because at the end of the day, we're all animals and we're all habitual thinkers and we do what's easiest and which requires the least amount of energy, energy you know, from a brain standpoint. So whatever's easiest, sort of like the heavy in law, whatever, you know, fires together, wires together. So when you think about all these things, because, you know, one of the issues right now has to do with a lot of noise. Everybody's developing an app. Everybody's running into the healthcare space. Everybody's developing these sensors. So what, where does the interoperability fit into your technology? Is the, is the Medio Smart Health system embedded in the electronic health record? Does something pop up immediately? Does a patient have to download and then request from the physician that they, you know, observe them through their telehealth, uh, you know, sessions? How does the workflow go and how do we encourage sort of the habitual methodology so it becomes a standard of practice? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I, I too often ignored, really, when people say we've got this, you know, nifty new technology, you know, how do you actually build it into a system which is known for resisting change? Uh, for good reason, right? You know, you don't want to change too quickly and take risks that endanger patients. You know, first do no harm. That's the, the medical cry, right? I think um, uh, the, our approach has been to build the system so it's as easy as possible to integrate everywhere. And so our goal is that we wanted to make a system that would um, be more or less kind of like a Google supercomputer in the cloud that would take any sensor feed be able to do, you know, healthcare, you know, biometrics and analysis, and then send results back wherever you want. And we built it on purpose to act like a web service so that it was the, the most easily uh, integrable system ever. And we've now demonstrated several systems that, that can work with that same, you know, unified backend that does kind of the healthcare computing, you know, kind of like a healthcare supercomputer in the cloud. Um, and, uh, and, and be able to, you know, identify people in the images, automatically figure out who they are, automatically take their vital signs, automatically write it to their medical record. Um, and it almost doesn't matter what it is that they're in front of. So the, the system that we have available now for consumers is you just go to uh, medio.ai, it's just a website. You don't even need to download an application. You just go to the website and you sign in and you know get your password and, and uh, uh, user ID and so on. Uh, tell, tell the system a little bit about yourself so we can uh, do better at identifying your issues. Um, and, uh, and then it just starts uh, anytime you log in and do a health check, uh, it, it'll answer you some screening questions, it asks you some screening questions about COVID in particular, uh, and it'll measure your vital signs while you're answering the questions, and then it logs it all to your health record and it generates a health pass that gives you kind of your risk of, uh, of having the virus uh, and whether or not you need further treatment or testing in the process. So, you know, that's a system now which just operates on a web service backend. Uh, we've done a similar version for cell phones. We've done versions to replace, you know, the push carts in the hospitals where the nurses, uh, you know, go around and, and every 15, every, you know, once every two hours, uh, they'll measure the vital signs of a patient. Uh, now we can replace it with just a camera in the room that, that measures them constantly. Um, you know, we have another system uh, that we're working with several providers to build uh, which which can be positioned in the um, in the triage or emergency room entrance, so that people walking in can be assessed even as they come into the area. Uh, multiple people in the image and and you know recording the vital signs for each of them, uh, and flagging any that that need particular attention. Um, so, so Philip, with all of this said, I mean we're obviously in a world we've seen you know a 30, 40 percent increase in the use and even higher of telehealth. Obviously, the peak was during you know the COVID pandemic you know, issues that were happening in the early part of the year, it has gone down a little bit. I mean, since the government has pulled away some of the funding, et cetera, uh, and the billing for some of it, but it's still hanging on. And there's still a lot of people who prefer using telehealth for security and safety and health reasons. 
is your technology something that we're talking about the internet of things and we're talking eventually about all kinds of other widgets and tools and things like you know bluetooth type of stethoscopes and all these other methodologies of doing the typical assessments that you would typically have to go in person to get done so when you're talking about blood you know oxygen levels and you know heartbeat and flush level you know using facial recognition and you know all sorts of other parameters just using your camera has the conversation taken place about incorporating this as a real patient reported outcomes um, in a really systematic way and then from that comes the next progression of, of, of questioning is is it going to move the needle on outcomes um, you know doing your technology versus standard of care which is in person and who eventually will pay for it because it's just as good or if not better than a stethoscope or you know some other you know way for you to check respirations and you know uh, you know your uh, your um, you know other things that we're using in in you know in person meeting so how does it fare in comparison who will eventually pay for it and is there going to be a regulatory pathway for these to be considered software as a medical device you know and and all those yeah. sorts of things so can you paint the picture for us about what the regulatory pathway and vision is yeah so so i think the the short answer to the the consequence starting you know kind of what what is the goal or the direction we're heading um, you know, the idea of performing these things with fewer people remotely without having a centralized facility means that it gets much, much cheaper uh, and people can get it more easily at less cost from anywhere. And, and I think that, you know, you're seeing a ramp up, you know, COVID, I think, was a real accelerator for the telehealth market. Um, and really what it's doing is, is introducing these capabilities to most people for the first time, you know, that you can actually be diagnosed and treated without going to the hospital. You can have an emergency condition and be in a remote place with your phone and still get care. Um, and so that's completely new. And you know, we take it a little bit for granted in the United States, but internationally, there are plenty of countries that don't have hospitals over much of their geography, and they still need to offer care to you know, billions of people. So you know, we, we see this as really um, an important step in, in democratizing the access to quality medical care where either the infrastructure isn't there or it's too costly for, you know, a sector of the population. You know, it's, it's hard to imagine, but, you know, we're, you know, the United States uh, healthcare outcomes are actually now worse than most of the industrialized world. Not because we've got the worst healthcare. We have some of the best healthcare, but we also have huge swaths of the country that don't have access to care. Whether it's, you know, urban uh, areas with no facilities or rural areas too far from, from the hospital infrastructure. So that's a real problem in the United States that we think is fixable. So <clears throat> that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build a system that does that. Now, as far as the regulatory pathway goes and what has to happen to get there, um, that's already a road that's in progress. Uh, and COVID has accelerated that as well. Um, so you, you probably know that there's all of this ambulatory monitoring uh, technology that's, that's kind of been slowly evolving in the marketplace, principally like the harnesses for uh, you know, cardiac uh, post-critical care patients. Um, and things of that nature, <clears throat> certainly in the, in the um, elder care and assisted living communities, uh, there's kind of a growing set of tools that you can plug into your phone and upload, you know, your latest data. <clears throat> but they're still too costly. They're still too high friction. And, and I think what, what the COVID situation has begin to, begun to, talk, to teach everyone is those first steps of the ambulatory care systems, they already have insurance billing codes. And so now we've got systems which can use those same billing codes, but replace all of that complicated, expensive stuff with a much more automated, much more streamlined, much lower cost, you know, underpinning infrastructure. And so we, we already have a mechanism to begin earning money from these types of, uh, 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 you know, treatments and, and, and so on. And our goal, of course, as a, as a technology infrastructure provider is to help everyone you know, establish new codes as we can treat more disease and, and diagnose more conditions. Uh, so it's an ongoing process, but it's, it's really accelerating now. Yeah, and so what's really interesting here, I think, is, is a real key pivotal uh, linchpin here is that it, the data that's collected from patients, consumers, you know, basically general public is ambient. It's, it's done seamlessly. It's done without effort. 
which is really what the resistance that you're talking about, which is the typical wearable, the watch, the, you know, something embedded in your clothing, something that you have to type in or, or really interact with. This is seamless and this is invisible. So on the, at the same token, one of the concerns, of course, is that when that's done seamlessly and invisibly, the question comes down is where does that data live? Does it, does it live remotely? Does it live just between the, the, uh, the interaction between that patient's mobile device and their physician's interface? Or does it exist in some cloud somewhere where it kind of gets washed, processed, and aggregated for you know, determination, analysis, et cetera? Who owns the data? How does it get monetized? And who's tapping into it? And certainly there's gonna be a whole question because right now we're sitting in this very precipice of this issue which is the, you know, the exact issue with COVID-19 contact tracing. One of the reasons that so many states and provinces and other places across the world are not embracing this is because of this very privacy, security, surveillance question about who's gonna do something with this data. So can you speak to you know, this whole crux of, of, of this issue? Yeah, I mean, the, the data privacy thing is, uh, is, is a really serious, serious challenge. And it's a challenge for a number of reasons. I, I think um, what the what the big internet companies have taught us, for good or ill, is that most people will give away their privacy for convenience, and not even realize that they're doing it. And so I think you know one of the things that needs to change is the way that um, that trade is being offered without making people aware that it's even happening. And so I think there does need to be more disclosure. Uh, and, and more transparency in the marketing of these services to say, we are taking your data, your data is the product that we sell to advertisers, just be aware. We cannot do that, but if you don't want us to do that, then we're gonna have to charge you for this service. So that, that's a conversation that's not happening. And, and I think the, you know, the, the position of the internet giants has been, well, if we tell people that, then they don't buy anything and they don't use the service and then it goes away. And that's the trade-off. So, this is why you and I are on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all those things, despite the fact that we know that they abuse the, the privacy limitations that we would prefer they have. Um, so, so I think that, that you know, from our perspective as, as developers of something that is managing even more sensitive data, so thinking of not just your personal identity, but your personal health information, which could be very damaging if it emerges in the wrong moment to someone that you don't want to have it. Uh, you know, we're already seeing cases where uh, insurance companies are buying the databases that have been hacked by, you know, international data pirates, and they're using it to figure out what to charge their own customers. So they're purchasing data sets to figure out how to gouge their customers even more. And, and data sets that, that the people never were even aware existed, much less, you know, realized that they were at risk of theft and, and exploitation. So, so that, that I think is a real challenge. And, and I, I think that from our, from our outset, what we're trying to do is partner with those companies that do have you know, a, a history of responsible use and protection of that data. Um, most of the healthcare providers that fall under the HIPAA compliance regulations um, you know, have you know, very active efforts to continually you know, protect and upgrade that data. And you know, we had a, a funny evolution early in, in, in the life of building the, the Medio services because you know, when we first began uh, working on it, we had conversations with a couple of hospitals uh, to say, you know, where would you like the data to be stored? And, and when we began working on this about three or four years ago, um, you know, the conversation was, well, we'd, we'd like it to be in a secure machine on our premises with all of our other secure data. Um, and so we're well, fine, you know, we can make it that way. And, you know, we use the network to deliver the data in an encrypted way, uh, you know, to the, the central store. Um, but then there was a moment where, you know, they got sued because some doctor had, you know, left a laptop with some of that data on an airplane and that was a $6 million lawsuit. And they said, never again. Now we want everything in the cloud. We want you to be responsible for the liability of, you know, managing that, that data security. And so, you know, we had to, we had to beef up that capability and make sure that the system was architected with, you know, kind of the latest, um, you know, uh, data security systems and it's an ongoing battle because you know hackers develop new tools we develop new abatement measures uh and you know we, we just have to do the best that we can um 
but uh, but that that's been kind of a, a moving target for us, and and our our effort has been how can we build the systems that are as secure as we can make them that give the users the tools that they need to protect their privacy, and we're as transparent as possible about who has responsibility for it. Yeah, and I think it really honestly begs the question, Philip. I mean, we're I think we're in a world where it, there's going to be a completely new definition or redefinition of what privacy and security is. I mean, I think that we live in a new world. What does that mean exactly? Who owns what? You can have a lot of different dialogue going back and forth about data ownership versus sharing and responsibility as it, as it re specifically relates in healthcare um, and who and wh when and who should monetize it. So you have the big players saying that, you know, data is data, but it has to be mined and refined like an oil refinery before it becomes valuable. So there's a lot of questions in addition to questions about things like, um, you know, blockchain. And, you know, with all this seamless ambient health data and other data, you know, going into these central systems and these data lakes is can people actually monetize through small like cryptocurrency every time somebody taps into using your data, you get paid for it. Um, this could potentially be the world of the new UBI. And uh, I think it'd be very interesting to see what transpires from these these one, these data lakes in the future. Yeah. So um. I'm a little I'm a little skeptical of some of the blockchain applications. We can, if you want, we can talk about that. But um, yeah. what what uh, where where would you like to steer us? Yeah. No, I just kind of wanted to, to kind of move in, and you know, we talked a little bit about the cardiovascular space, um, the work that you're doing with ambient biometrics, and the work around sort of the whole cardiovascular space, and also some of the work that you're doing in a very timely way with COVID nineteen and the measurement of this, and people actually doing some of this as contact tracing, but with the goal and the aspiration that um, your company is moving towards a Brainworks, what's kind of the next step? What are the big next big questions or things that you're trying, difficult problems that you're trying to solve? Well, you know, it's interesting. We, we, um, we had, you know, before the COVID crisis hit, you know, we had uh, quite an extensive roadmap of, you know, every quarter we'd be rolling out some new um, biomarker that we would measure and we would use it to address a different condition. So we were working on systems for um, you know, seizure prediction and management. We were working on systems for uh, musculoskeletal uh, motor deficit analysis so we could track and, and, and manage Parkinson's and ALS and, and see people who had joint or skeletal or muscular injuries when they walked into the hospital. Um, we had uh, ideas of how we could apply it to drug efficacy measurement and track where you are on your medication cycle. Um, so all these things that we felt like we could use the AI systems to pull out that information and, and help manage a, a growing range of conditions. And, and our vision, of course, is we'd have this one system in the cloud and just by wandering in front of the camera or whatever sensor we have set up, you know, we can figure out more and more about your health and help you deal with more and more stuff. Um, but then of course, you know, COVID hit. And, and you know, our, our trials kind of got stopped at the hospital as they went on to a war footing uh, for the, the pandemic. Um, and so we, we kind of transformed into, you know, realizing that we had the perfect tool, not just to do survey questions, but to validate them against the vital signs that we were measuring um, and to be able to build those tools for the workforce. So what we have coming out in the next couple of weeks is, uh, you know, today what's on the market at, at medio.ai is uh, the consumer version where anyone can go sign on and start using it to track their their health and uh, get a health pass they can share with their friends see when you know here i'm still in the green you know we can socialize let's go to a barbecue um oh you're red yellow you should probably get tested or red you know be in a quarantine um so so that that sort of thing is is already available now we're about to release the the workforce version so a company can manage their employees or a school can manage their students and staff um, and, and keep everyone safe. And there's a bunch of other pieces to it, like access control and temperature monitoring and, at, at entryways. Um, but what the, the big puzzle that we have now turned to uh, is testing, COVID testing. And, and the challenge, of course, is, is we can build all of these software systems that detect the symptoms. But as you probably know, 40% of the COVID cases today are asymptomatic. They show no symptoms. There's nothing there to detect with a sensor other than a sensor that you can you know, perform a biochemical test. So either a reverse transcription PCR or an antigen or an antibody test. Um, there needs to be some sort of biochemical test. 
to detect the asymptomatic carriers. And the problem that, that you know, I think is getting too little press is that to do that properly, you need to test once every serial interval. So the serial interval is how long does it take you to go from infection you know, of yourself to being able to infect someone else? Uh, and you know, what is the average time between your infection and the infection that you pass on to someone else? Right now, we know that's about 3.9 days. So we need to test people at least every 3.9 days to be safe. Mm -hmm. And the, the amount of testing that's currently available in the US is a tiny fraction of that. And you know, even these companies that are like Abbott and, and the rest that are building these uh, you know, point of care tests where they say in six months, we're gonna ramp up to a, 100 million units a, a year, not enough just to test the school kids. Yeah, just to absolutely. test the school kids twice a week. You know, that's so six just million talking, tests so, twice a week. So talking about Abbott in just the last few minutes that we have here is we have a lot of pharmaceutical, medical device, biotech companies that follow our channel. And let's just say somebody theoretically wants to partner with Brainworks. What would be some of the entry points, the potential opportunities for partnerships, for pilots to investigate something, either as an extension to um, their, you know, to prevent, you know, loss of exclusivity to one of their patents or to launch into a new space with this new um, tool that can help with diagnostics with their potential, you know, patients or groups. What would be some of these entry points or uh, partnership opportunities that you could define? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. For us right now, we're looking for partners where we can drastically ramp up the, what I would call screening tests for schools. So low cost, high volume, high frequency tests using the latest uh, kind of gene, and the genetic uh, genome analysis tools. Uh, and we, we have a plan and that's a technology set and an analytical tool set uh, to be able to really scale that up. Uh, and so if there are lab testing companies that would like to move in that direction and help us get our kids safely in schools, at a, at a rate of testing that, that very few have managed so far, uh, we're, uh, we're looking for partners to do that, both on the, um, on the lab side, uh, as well as the reagent kits and the equipment supplies. Brilliant, love it. Um, we could probably talk for a long time, but I love the work that Brain, uh, Brainworks is doing, um, some of the really impressive ideas, and the fact that you're just making this so accessible. Uh, you know, I know that we have issues with things like the digital divide, et cetera, but there's still also, let's look on the positive, the, the, the power and the number of people that actually do have cell phones and the number of people that do have internet. We need to, we shouldn't always look at the negative side, but look at the positive side of, of who we can actually target as well. So this is a fascinating topic. For those people who are interested in getting a hold of Philip, we will be leaving a link to his, his credentials, his contact information in the show notes as well as a link to his website. So for companies who might want to partner or consider or discuss further, you'll be able to find his information below. We also invite you to connect with us at impetusdigital.com. Um, these are some of these big, hairy, audacious conversations that you can also have in your own private, private virtual platform. You know, going beyond the pill discussions or talking about things that can help to extend what you're doing with your brands, with your services, with your business models talking to stakeholders, getting various partners, innovators, entrepreneurs on board, and having these longitudinal discussions asynchronously and synchronously. We can have a chat with you and describe and discuss how we might be able to partner. So thank you so much, everybody, for attending today's conversation and listening to us. It's been an absolute pleasure, Philip, speaking with you. Oh, my and, God. Uh, and loved talking to you and wishing everybody a wonderful day ahead. Thanks so much, Natalie. Bye, everyone.